principles or guiding beliefs of uh, the Jehovah's Witness organization. And firstly, do you consider Jehovah God to be a loving God? Absolutely, First John 4, 8 says so. And do you consider Jehovah God to be a compassionate God? Uh, yes, I do. And does Jehovah God recognize the worth and dignity of all human beings? Absolutely. So in other words, not restricted only to those who are members of the Jehovah's Witness. Recognize the worth and dignity of all human beings. Absolutely. So in other words, not restricted only to those who are members of the Jehovah's Witnesses. No. And obviously that includes women and children. Women and children as well. There's choices. Uh, yes, we do. And as I understand it, you, your organization does recognize an individual's freedom to report crimes to the authorities. Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> as I understand it, people who no longer want to be known <clears throat> as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, but who have been, must then dissociate, is that right? Uh, no, not uh, necessarily. Um, I meet many people in my travel that uh, perhaps were Jehovah's Witnesses at one stage, but then have decided no longer to be active, well, as they haven't gone through a formal process. Well, I've, I've chosen my words deliberately, uh, Mr. Jackson. If, okay. if someone no longer wants to be known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they oh, must then dissociate, yes. is that right? Uh, well, again, please, uh, if they want to take the action of doing that, but of course <laughs> they have total freedom if they don't want to apply to officially be uh, removed as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they can tell anyone they want that they're no longer a Jehovah's Witness. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, but perhaps I can take you to tab 109, page 155, so this is... Uh, the manual organized to do Jehovah's Will. Is this the section on disassociation? Yes, that's right. So this is uh, a manual which is issued to all baptized Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that right? That is correct. And this or, is... Let me clarify, uh, sorry, let me, to be precise, uh, those who are approved uh, uh, to go from door to door. Well, so someone who is preparing for baptism and is an unbaptized publisher would be allowed to have a copy. Okay, I see. So all baptized Jehovah's Witnesses would uh, be guided by this, but in addition you say some who are not yet baptized. Uh, publisher would be allowed to have a copy. Okay, I see. So all baptized Jehovah's Witnesses would uh, be guided by this, but in addition, you say some who are not yet baptized may also have a copy of this. That so, is correct. Thank you, yes. Uh, no, there isn't one available. Yes. All right, so if we action applies to the action taken by a person, um, and the assistant edition is there. Uh, no, there isn't one available. Yes. All right, so if we action applies to the action taken by a person who, although a baptized member of the congregation, deliberately repudiates his Christian standing, reject, rejecting the congregation by his actions, or by stating that he no longer wants to be recognized as or known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So... Is it the case then that someone who no longer wants to be recognized as or known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses... Uh, well, again, please, uh, uh, if they want to take the process. action of doing that, but of course <laughs> they have total freedom if they don't want to apply to officially be uh, removed as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they can tell anyone they want that they're no longer a Jehovah's Witness. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, but perhaps I can take you to tab 109 page 155, so this is uh, the manual organized to do Jehovah's Will. <clears throat> the 
Is this the section on disassociation? Yes, that's right. So this is uh, a manual which is issued to all baptized Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that right? That is correct. And this or, is... Let me clarify. Uh, sorry, let me to be precise. Uh, those who are approved uh, uh, to go from door to door. Well, so someone who is preparing for baptism and is an unbaptized publisher would be allowed to have a copy. Okay, I see. So all baptized Jehovah's Witnesses would uh, be guided by this, but in addition you say some who are not yet baptized may also have a copy of this. That so, is correct. Thank you, yes. Um, and the assistant edition is there. Uh, no, there isn't one available. Yes. All right, so if we action applies to the action taken by a person who, although a baptized member of the congregation, deliberately repudiates his Christian standing, reject, rejecting the congregation by his actions, or by stating that he no longer wants to be recognized as or known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So is it the case then that someone who no longer wants to be recognized as or known as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, must then disassociate? Uh, no, it doesn't say they must do anything. Uh, if you read on, you'll see there's a process. Uh, this gives the person the right to officially have an announcement made that they're no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. But as I already said, if they decide they don't want to exercise that right, uh, they don't automatically come under this provision. People who don't exercise that right are then, in other words, they, as you described, inactive. They are still subject to the rules and discipline of the organisation, aren't they? Um, I, I would have to check on that because personally, I, that's not my field. But my understanding is, if a person has made it uh, known by their actions in the community over a period of years that they're not witnesses. We would only uh, hold any reports in abeyance until they decided they wanted to return. Well, um, Mr. Jackson, I have to say that my understanding is as if someone in that position uh, is caught transgressing one of the rules, then they would still be subject to the disciplinary procedures, including possibly disfellowshipping. Is that not right? And that is a possibility, but I, in all fairness uh, to your question, uh, I think there are circumstances that uh, I couldn't make a de definitive comment on that. Yes. And so, for example, if they had become inactive or sought to fade without formally dissociating, uh, and the elders came to visit and found them celebrating Christmas or a birthday, they would be found to be in transgression of the rules, would they not? Uh, that is not my understanding. Uh, uh, but again, as I said, it's not my field. Uh, that goes into policy with regard to uh, uh, those type of things. Uh, but from my personal experience, that's not the case. Well, Mr. Sneed, you say it's not your field, but you're a member of the governing body, which is responsible, as you've said, for the whole field, and you've been a member for 10 years, and all the committees are, are responsible to and accountable to the governing body. So uh, that is correct. So it is your field, isn't it? Uh, only as far as approving the basic uh, scriptural principle. So is there a scriptural principle that you have in mind you want to ask me about, or are you talking about policies and implementation of policies? So there's a, there is a difference there. Yeah. And the policies are all subject to the scriptural principles, aren't they? Uh, yes, and if you have a question on the scriptural principle, and, I'm very happy to try and explain it. And for that reason, the policies have to be approved by the governing body to ensure that they are in keeping with scriptural principles. That's correct. But the fact that the policies at times need to be changed uh, shows that uh, uh, there is leeway there. And uh, if it's not the case, as you seem to suggest might be a possibility, although you say you don't know, if it's not the case that someone uh, who has not actively disassociated but merely sought to fade or become inactive is not governed by the rules, then where's the line drawn between those who are subject to the rules and those who aren't? Uh, that's a good question, and that's where 
judgment comes in. By judgment, I mean using a person's nous as to, is someone still perceived as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the community? Well, isn't that the point, that if someone is perceived as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the community, that's because they have not disassociated or been disfellowshipped? Well, it has to do with what the person is telling other persons. Well, there's no middle road, is there? I mean, you're either a member and subject to the organization, or you're not. Isn't that the case? Yes, but I thought you were asking me about disassociation. Well, I am indeed. So if someone hasn't disassociated but has sought merely to become inactive or to fade, they're then still subject to the organization's discipline and rules. If they acknowledge being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And if they do the contrary, which is to say they're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, the effect of that is disassociation. That's if they decide to go down that course. And if they don't actively disassociate, then they will be disfellowshipped as apostates. No, an apostate is someone who actively goes against what the Bible teaches. Well, if the elders come on the door to a former member and they, or sorry, to a member who's been inactive and sought to fade away and says, well, are you still a Jehovah's Witness or not? And the person says, well, no, I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness. The consequence of that will be either disfellowshipping or disassociation, won't it? No, I don't agree with that. Not from what I've seen. Like, can I just say this hypothetical situation, which is probably one that could happen, two elders call at the door of someone, they're not going to come out and say, hello, I'm celebrating Christmas. It presupposes that Jehovah's Witnesses have some sort of spy network to monitor these people, which we don't. But if that person says, look, I was baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, but I'm no longer active, no doubt the elders will say, well, we would encourage you to return. Is there anything we can do to help you? Now, in that process of them returning, if they feel prompted to say that they have been living a lifestyle that is contrary to what Jehovah's Witnesses would live, then certainly we would handle that. Well, let's take that hypothesis where they visit this household. This household. Mr. Jackson, can you hear me? I can, yes. Sorry, you started. I didn't hear a question. Yes, it was echoing back at me, but it seems to have been resolved. Mr. Jackson, let's take that hypothesis of the two elders visit the household of someone who's been inactive for some time and seek to explore whether that person will come back to the active fold and encourage them to do so, in the process of which, in visiting that household, they find that that person is, in the eyes of the Jehovah's Witness, living in sin. That person would then be subject to the discipline of the organization, wouldn't they? In a case such as that, yes. And their only way to avoid that would be to disassociate. If they didn't want to go through the process, but might I mention in your hypothetical situation, the person has indicated that they want to come back, and many, many people in that situation do want to come back. No, Mr. Jackson, my hypothetical had nothing to do with anyone wanting to come back. My hypothetical is premised on the basis that someone wants to leave or not be involved, and I'm exploring the possibility which you put out there of them being able to just become inactive and not actually end up outside the organization or not end up disassociating. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So, I do. Sorry, I, was, uh, I misunderstood the fact that you said that they uh, were, they'd indicated they wanted to come back. I'm sorry. So the point we've, we've got to then is that, as I understand it, is that uh, a person who's become inactive and wishes merely to remain inactive uh, is still subject to the organization's rules and discipline, not so. Uh, if you want to come back, but we don't 
we don't run a police state where we go and try and force people to follow our, our, uh, our beliefs. Well, leaving that to one side, the point is if, for example, the elders visited and found the person to be living in sin in the eyes of the Jehovah's Witnesses, then uh, the elders would, following the process and procedures, uh, discipline that person under the rules of the organization, not so. Uh, yes, according, like in a situation where uh, it was found that someone who claimed to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, was living in sin, uh, then the elders would try to ascertain, well, what needs to be done? We obviously want to help the person, so the first step would be to ascertain, uh, do they want to come back? Are they willing to uh, uh, change what they're doing? Uh, and if ultimately the person uh, is willing to talk to us, uh, then yes, uh, that would be involved with the judicial process. But if they're not, then either they must disassociate or they'll be disfellowshipped. Uh, that would be in, in that particular case, but I can think of many scenarios where it wouldn't be. And it's right, isn't it, that in the case of both disassociation and disfellowshipping, the remaining members of the Jehovah's Witnesses cannot associate with the disassociated or disfellowshipped person? Yes, that's according to the Bible principles, which I'm sure you've already read. And that it's even family members not living in the same household. Freedom from the organization on the one hand and friends, family and social network on the other. Uh, I thought I made it quite clear that I don't agree with that uh, supposition. Well, I think uh, you see, are we talking about a gross sin that's been committed or someone who just wants to leave Jehovah's Witnesses? Let me, let me clarify it. If someone no longer wants to be an active Jehovah's Witness, and they're not uh, in the community viewed as a Jehovah's Witness, we do not have a so-called spiritual police force to go and, and handle that. Mr. Jackson, the reality of the situation is, is that one, a person who's been baptized a Jehovah's Witness is thereafter either in the organization or out of it. Is that not right? I think perhaps you've uh, got your facts a little wrong there. Well, I, I don't think that's correct because you've accepted already, Mr. Jackson, that a person in the situation you've postulated of merely becoming inactive is still subject to the rules of the organization. Uh, yes, but if I can mention, Mr. Stewart, your first uh, proposition you put forward, that they meet someone who's celebrating Christmas. Uh, yeah, this person is not associating with other Jehovah's Witnesses, not actively uh, trying to change other people and so on. A, a person su such as that is not going to be handled judicially, as far as I understand. They... So, sorry, I have to disagree with you. Well, no, but, but Mr. Jackson, you're, dis someone. you're disagreeing on the example of what they do wrong. And that's not my point. My point is they may do nothing wrong, but they're still subject to the rules of the organization in the event that at some point they do do something wrong. I will agree with that, yes. but I don't so, agree with the sweeping statement. They only have the two choices. Well, that was the point I was disagreeing with. Well, it's right then, isn't it? Because if they don't want to be subject to the discipline and rules of the organization, then they have to leave by actively dissociating. Isn't that the truth? Uh, that's if they definitely don't want to be, yes. But there are some that uh, do not want to make that active move. Well, the result then is, is they're faced with the choice between the freedom, of the freedom from the organization on the one hand and having to leave the, lose their family and friends and social network on the other. Uh, that's how you would like to put it, Mr. Stewart, but I thought I'm trying to say that there are those, some of whom I have heard of, that uh, just fade away and uh, they're, they're not actively Jehovah's Witnesses. And, Mr. Jackson, you, you've put it that they have a choice uh, to leave or not to leave. For someone who wants to leave, perhaps because they've suffered abuse by someone in the organization and don't feel that it's been treated properly or adequately, it's a very difficult choice, isn't it? 
because they must choose. I agree with that. And it can yes. be it can be a very cruel choice for them. Not so. I agree. It's a difficult choice. And it can be personally devastating because they can lose their whole social network and their families. Uh, that can be the case, yes. Would you accept then that putting people to that choice through this system of disassociating from them or shunning, as it's sometimes referred to, is contrary to the Jehovah's Witness belief in freedom of religious choice? Uh, no, I don't accept that. Uh, I think you're jumping to a conclusion there, but I understand that you have that opinion. Well, on what basis do you not accept that? Because right throughout uh, the arrangement with Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, people have to make choices based on their own free, to, free will. For example, uh, to be baptized. If someone walks up to us and says, I want to get baptized, but we're not going to allow them to be baptized. They have to, first of all, understand the arrangement of Christian living. Uh, usually it takes uh, one or two years for them to go through uh, both the publications that we have uh, so that they personally can make that commitment. So that is a choice that they make. Now, we are not forcing them in any ways to remain in our organization. But a point to, to remember is that the ultimate uh, standard we believe in is the Bible, and we feel it's good for people to live by the Bible. The fact that many who have been disfellowshipped return of their own free will is an uh, indication that they likewise still believe that it's a good lifestyle. Mr. So Jack, you were baptized at age 13, am I right? I certainly was, yes. And there are, in fact, many Jehovah's Witnesses who are baptized at an age even younger than that. Uh, there have been some I have met that have been baptized younger. And you consider that at that age someone is old enough and mature enough to make a decision affecting the rest of their lives? Uh, yes, I do in some cases. Obviously, uh, there are uh, some children that uh, wouldn't be able to make that decision. And perhaps some would have questioned whether I could make that decision at 13 years of age. But I've worked with people that have been baptized when they were 11, and they have stuck by that determination their whole life. Well, that may be because they can't leave the organization without leave it, leaving behind everyone whom they know. Uh, anything is possible. Mm. You see, let's take someone who's baptized at a, at a young age, and then as sly elsewhere, and they want to choose some other system of belief they're then still going to be faced with the stark choice that we've identified, aren't they? That's true. So on that basis, I suggest to you that that policy and practice of your organization is in conflict with the Jehovah's Witnesses' belief, as you've said it, it is, in freedom of religious choice. And no, we don't see it that way, but you're entitled to your opinion. And I suggest also that it's in conflict with the idea of a loving and a compassionate God. Uh, certainly, uh, that wouldn't be in harmony with the Bible, what the Bible says, because at times uh, Jehovah disciplined his uh, uh, people by having them go into exile, come back. So uh, Jehovah is someone who believes in the ultimate overall benefit of good for persons. And some that, sometimes that includes uh, some form of uh, discipline. And do you accept that putting people to that choice <clears throat> makes your organization, in many respects, a captive organization? I do not accept that at all. Is there a scriptural basis to this policy of shunning? Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to express it. Uh, 1 Corinthians is the scripture, and no doubt you've seen it already. But um, 1 Corinthians, that's on page 1530. Can you just identify and, uh, in this, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, starting at verse 1, it speaks of a situation where there was sexual immorality, in the congregation in Corinth. Sorry, Mr. Jackson, my, uh, I'm really just asking, is there a scriptural basis, and you've identified what it is, because my next oh, question is, okay. is can it 
can it change? In other words, is there a basis upon which you foresee that your organization might be able to change that policy? Uh, no. Now, do you recognize, Mr. Jackson, and in asking this question, let me make it clear, I'm not suggesting it's peculiar to the Jehovah's Witness organization. There are many, many organizations in this position. But do you accept that the Jehovah's Witness organization has a problem with child abuse amongst its members? I accept that child abuse is a problem right throughout the community, and it's something that we've had to deal with as well. And do you accept that it's presented, I withdraw that, do you accept that the manner in which your organization has dealt with allegations of child sexual abuse uh, has also presented problems? Uh, there have been changes in policies over the last 20 or 30 years where we've tried to address uh, some of those uh, uh, problem areas, and by the fact that we've changed the policy would indicate that the original policies weren't perfect. And you accept, of course, that your organization, including people in positions of responsibility like elders, are not immune from the problem of child sexual abuse? Uh, that appears to be the case. And do you accept, Mr. Jackson, that many of the efforts that are being made by different people and organizations to highlight the issue of child sexual abuse and try and find solutions are genuine efforts to improve the situation? I do accept that, and that's why I'm happy to testify. And that such efforts are not necessarily an attack on your organization or its system of beliefs? Uh, we understand that too. And you described earlier in your testimony that the work of the this Royal Commission is beneficial. Do you accept then that the Royal Commission's efforts are genuine and well-intentioned? I certainly do. And that's why we came into the Royal Commission hoping that collectively something would come forward that would help us as well as everybody else. And would you disagree then with anyone who said that the efforts to highlight and deal with child sexual abuse in the Jehovah's Witness Church uh, is engaging in apostate lies? Uh, I guess that's a, a broad question because sometimes those who make these accusations make many other accusations as well. Uh, but let me assure you, uh, the person making the accusation is not the main thing. The main thing is, is there some basis to the accusation? And if there is some, some way that we can improve, the governing body is always interested in seeing how we can refine our policies. You see, uh, Mr. Stewart, could I just emphasize, as a religion, two very strong things we feel. One is we try to keep a high moral standard, and secondly, there's love among the, the organization. So, so we want to, to uh, treat uh, uh, victims in a loving way. Well, just on that point, Mr. Jackson, has the governing body considered uh, apologizing to survivors of child sexual abuse at the hands of uh, elders within the organization? Uh, I haven't been in any discussions with regard to that. Is that something that you foresee might happen? In other words, that it, uh, an apology at least be considered? Uh, the governing body has apologized on other matters. So uh, for me to say uh, I can't speak collectively for everybody, but uh, we have apologized on things in the past in other areas, so it is perceivable. And has the governing body considered the introduction of a scheme of paying compensation to people within the organization who have suffered child sexual abuse at the hands of elders? Uh, uh, well, let me say there are many schemes that we've uh, had with regard to human humanitarian areas uh, where, uh, like flood victims and so on, 
I know this is not related. I'm just explaining. The governing body is happy this, uh, for our organization to spend money helping persons. How much more so someone who has been traumatized or affected in a bad way? <clears throat> Those are my questions for Mr. Jackson, Your Honour. You know, I suspect, Mr. Jackson, that the Commission is considering a redress scheme for which there for survivors. Are you aware of that? Uh, I did hear it mentioned, Your Honour, but I have no idea of the details. Well, one of the suggestions is that there, is that there should be a scheme, national or otherwise, in which all of the institutions in which people were abused come together and provide for an independent decision-making process which would enable a fair distribution of compensation for those who were abused. Do you understand? I do understand, Your Honour. Would the Jehovah's Witness in a joint scheme with other institutions where people were abused? Uh, Your Honour, uh, the answer is we, we need to see the details. But the possibility of us making sure help is given to those uh, that have been victims, certainly that is a possibility. Well, does that mean that the Jehovah's Witnesses would not, as a matter of principle, decline to join with other institutions in a coordinated redress scheme? Uh, Your Honour, we would need to see that the, the nothing was scripturally against us doing that, but uh, th there are many times when we have to deal with others uh, with regard to uh, financial matters. So, per se, uh, it's not something that is totally out of the uh, option pool. I want to ask you a question about a different matter. Um, yes. Mr Stewart raised with you the difficulty of your adherence to the biblical references that require two witnesses before an allegation can be accepted. Do you understand? I do understand that. Now, we had evidence, and indeed this will, I'm sure, be your experience, that uh, you uh, hear from a person who alleges that something wrong has happened and you yourself are entirely convinced of what they're saying to you uh, and are satisfied that it's correct. You understand? I do understand. And you can be in that position when there is no other witness to the event. That is correct. Now, what does the church do in the circumstance where the allegation may be against a father or someone who otherwise has close contact with a family, but there is only the allegation of the child, perhaps a girl, teenage girl. So the allegation can't be established. What does the church do about helping that child and or that family? That's a very good question. Uh, first of all, uh, the elders should uh, let the, uh, uh, the responsible adult uh, or the victim, uh, if possible, know that they have a right to take this to the criminal authorities, the judicial system. But that's just a matter of notifying them of that. But because we are concerned about the actual physical welfare of someone in a situation like that, uh, we would make sure that there are uh, provisions made that uh, of course, if it's in the family, we can't take the child out of the family physically, uh, but at least make sure that things are uh, put into place so that this person gets the best possible care and protection. Well, what do you put in place? If I or allow the, uh, say, it's the guardian uh, of this uh, victim, uh, what they need to do, and of course, if it goes to the police, then it goes right into that whole uh, government-type arrangement whereby uh, the government has authority to perhaps come in and separate families and so on. But, Mr Jackson, many of these people don't want to go to the police because 
that involves potentially a public process trial and so on. It's very common that people don't want to go to the police. But in the assumptions that I've put to you, the young person has acknowledged the church's obligation imposed upon them to report the misbehaviour to the church. You understand? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then they find that the church won't determine the allegation to be true and act accordingly because there's only one witness, that is the young person. What does the church do to help that person or that family in those circumstances? Well, as I mentioned, uh, first of all, we want, uh, we would let them know that they should go to the police and try and, because this is well, beyond we, the process. Mr Jackson, we, co we covered that. This is a yes. person, and there are okay. many of them who don't want mm -hmm. to go to the police, but they've come to your organisation because they're required to, to report misbehaviour. And uh, underlying my proposition is, of course, that they would expect your organisation to help them. Yes. Well, what do you yes. do? What and do the help that is... Well, uh, can I just mention, first of all, Your Honour, uh, our organisation, people come to our Christian meetings uh, twice a week and they go on the preaching work. But what happens in the home is beyond the actual jurisdiction of the elders uh, to tell the, the parents how they should organise uh, the things with their children. Uh, and the point that I'd just like to make is... You see, then everyone is put on alert. Once the accusation is made, now we're aware. Uh, could it be that the father, in improper situation, another time uh, is seen by the mother, and uh, then she brings this forward? Then we have two witnesses. Yeah, but I'm putting to you the proposition that you have one witness who you absolutely believe. Yes. What, what do you do? Well, for the ultimate protection... Of, uh, of that child, uh, I could, if they feel that child and other children are in danger, I can, well, I would hope that the conscience of the elders would notify the police if uh, the parent is not willing to do that. So you would hope that the elders would act in that way. Is there any instruction, yes. is there any instruction that they are to act in that way? Uh, you know, your Honour, this is not my field. I can't uh, tell you all uh, the, the sections where we've said that. Uh, that is my understanding. But if that instruction isn't given, that's perhaps something that we need to look at. And if the girl says, no, I don't want the matter to go to the police, I don't want the prospect of a criminal trial, but please can the church help me, what do you do? So then scriptural help would be given, but can't go in and take a child away from parents. What do you mean by scriptural? So spiritual. What's, what's, what's the scriptural? scriptural help. What would that be? So, uh, well, <laughs> perhaps one of the scriptural things that we could show is, uh, you know, the God's Love book uh, that was uh, referred to in this commission, I think. I don't think you have the, the last couple of pages of that book uh, for me to refer to. But there's a footnote there that talks about legal and judicial, uh, uh, sorry, secular action with regard to uh, uh, other witnesses. And there's a very clear footnote that says that if someone does something like rape or a serious crime, uh, this is definitely does not, uh, uh, that shouldn't, uh, sorry, that should not stop a witness from reporting it to the authorities. So we would try to spiritually help them to become aware of uh, their rights and the need, because maybe it's their decision, but if this affects other children, uh, neighbours and so on, surely they need to think a little beyond just the, the one person. Uh, then the scriptural help that we would give is similar to uh, other situations where people have experienced horrific tragedies in their lives. And their hope and trust in the Bible will give them some comfort. Uh, we found that 9-11, uh, when the Twin Towers went down, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were invited actually to go in and, and uh, help persons by sharing scriptures with them. Now, if the circumstance is that the young person alleges they were abused by 
a member of the congregation, but not a member of their own family. And again, um, you as the elder um, are persuaded, totally persuaded, that the person is telling the truth. What do you do then? Uh, the assumption, so behind, the the person, assumption behind it, of course, is that the alleged abuser is a risk to others. What do you do? That's correct, yes. Uh, so there is a, a process, and I think at the moment we are in the process of adjusting some of our policies, so that's why it is a good time for this Royal Commission. Uh, but definitely it becomes obvious that uh, we need to inform some uh, we need to uh, put restrictions on that person as to uh, any type of association with minors. Uh, and if a person is genuinely innocent, they're not doing this, they should not mind the fact that uh, they can clear their name by not being involved at all with uh, dealing with children. Uh, Your Honour, could I just mention as a reminder, you see, Jehovah's Witnesses, because we... Uh, respect the family unit. We don't have separate Sunday schools. We don't run youth camps separately. Uh, so it, we believe that things should be done within the family. But the spiritual help that we can give and trying to protect avoiding contact with someone who's accused with minors is a little easier for us because we don't have those youth group separate type uh, arrangements. Does anyone else have any questions? Ms. David. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Um, I'm um, Ms. David, and I represent BCG. Uh, are you familiar with BCG's case? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not. No, uh, I haven't lived in Australia for 36 years, and I haven't certainly had a chance to look through the files. Uh, well, BCG was one of the witness statements uh, and gave evidence at this commission. Um, have you? You haven't had the opportunity to read her evidence or to look at her statement? I have, and I'm sorry. Uh, the reason I came here was to care for my ailing father, and that's taken a lot of my time. Plus, I wasn't aware of the fact that I would be called before the Commission. I understand that, uh, Mr Jackson, but just uh, do you not think that it is important, and I appreciate your own personal circumstances, not a criticism, but do you appreciate that it is very important for people in such senior positions as yours to really have a good understanding of the perspective of a survivor of abuse as BCG is? I, I agree with that comment and, and let me say I empathise. Uh, I don't know the details of what happened to the person you're representing but I certainly empathise with whatever tragedy he or she has had to face. But do you agree that unless um, your organisation takes a, you know, organises some research or study into the plight of people such as BCG, they will never really understand how the processes you have in place affect them. That is a valid comment. And at this stage, would you agree that you have not really undertaken or organised to undertake any such research or um, studies into the uh, experience of people, young people uh, or people of any age that have been abused within the organisation? Um, that is a little hard for me to, to say, uh, give a definitive answer. Uh, within the parameters of how we normally do research for our publications and so on, and the fact that our service departments are handling cases such as your client, uh, they have uh, considered a lot of the, uh, the, the approaches that we've taken, and that's why we have changed things. And I'm sure the policies have changed since the time uh, of the person you were rep uh, representing was actually uh, uh, helped or handled. Just, just, just remaining on that point, you're aware that a Dr Monica Applewhite gave evidence before the Commission? I am aware, but I certainly didn't get a chance to see it. I apologise. Are you aware that uh, she was provided with some documentation or some witness statements from the, from the Jehovah's Witness uh, elders, but she was not provided with any witness statements from the survivors of uh, abuse that 
um, have uh, been provided during the course of this proceedings? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I really am not in a position to say anything about because uh, could I just explain, as empathetic as I am uh, to the, the case, uh, what I would hope for is that at the end of this commission, uh, those who have had far more experience than I have in this subject uh, will be giving recommendations to the governing body. I appreciate that, and, and certainly I, I certainly noted uh, what uh, you have said in, in the evidence today. I just want to make the point that can you understand how um, people like BCG who have had nothing but just really very traumatic uh, experiences um, feel very concerned when they feel that they they don't their voices are not being listened to at all by the uh, senior members of your organisation. Uh, I'd be very disappointed if that's the case, and certainly I would hate for that impression to be given to the person you're representing. Well, and and so in in. In your efforts to ensure that in the future um, these uh, that the processes will be uh, reviewed to ensure that the perspective of the abused person is um, given proper heed, would you do you think it would be a good idea for your organisation to actually conduct some sort of research? Uh, I think. The, the more information we can get, the better, because all of us are trying to deal with a very horrific problem and uh, any amount of information we can get would be beneficial. I just want to make the point here, it's a very, uh, it is a very horrific problem, but the problems that have been, the, that BCG and others like her have experienced are compounded by their experience with it, by having to go through the processes within your uh, own congregation. So what I'm saying, it's a, it's a universal problem, but it has, there are specific issues that clearly just relate to how the Jehovah's Witness have been dealing with it. So I guess what I'm suggesting, how important it is that it be a review that have specific regard to your processes. Um, I take your point as a valid point. Um, just want to come to, on the issue of uh, BCG. Uh, I know you're not aware of her case, but I will just very briefly give a, an overview, um, having regard to uh, trying not to take too much time. But uh, she made a complaint. It was ultimately, initially there was, because of the one witness rule, it was not accepted. Ultimately, on an appeal and with a confession, there was an acceptance of her complaint. She essentially did not make a full complaint to the authorities until after she left the congregation, I think approximately 15 years um, later. Um, but in the interim, when her, the abuse was by her father, in the interim, uh, approximately seven years after she was initially abused, she learned that her father, BCH, had been reinstated back into the church. Um, uh, that's a very pocket view, uh, short <coughs> history, but upon that event, that she wrote an impassioned five-page letter to the head office in Australia about her position um, and sought help. What she also sought was she, an assurance that the matter would be handled. She was leaving it absolutely. Her issue was entirely, this is a devout young Jehovah's Witness woman, she was leaving it in the care of the Jehovah's Witness Church to do something. Uh, and she wrote a letter, she said, Now I can only leave the matter in your hands and pray Jehovah directs the outcome, whatever it may be. But she asked, she implored uh, head office not to, to, Bethel not to ignore the letter and to do something about the terrible situation. She explained about her suicide attempt. She uh, explained the devastation to her and to her sisters who were also abused. What the... What was sent back to her was a letter, and if it could be look at, please, at Tender Bundle 30. Uh, 
Uh, yes, I have it here. You have that letter. This is this is the this was after seven years of, of this uh, BCG has given evidence that after that you know in all that after she made the complaint that she did not receive any assistance or su certainly sufficient assist support or even scriptural support. But if you could look at that um, letter. You can see that it, it says, firstly, always throw your burden on Jehovah. Are you, can you see that in the second paragraph? In the second paragraph, yes, I can. Yes. She was also told your, about the heartwarming prayer of David is uh, appropriate where he entreat, entreated Jehovah to preserve his tears in a skin bottle. She has given evidence uh, here to the effect that she felt silenced by what she was told. Mm. Um, and she also said, and what she was essentially advised, if you go to the third paragraph, is that by um, that with Jehovah's help and your own efforts, you can look forward to the new world of peace. But she was really given no solace to deal with what was going to continue to be a very painful for her in this world. Do you agree with that? But, but having uh, read through that no, letter. So, yes, and this is the first time I've seen the letter. Uh, my apologies. But uh, I, I would agree with you that if this is the only help she got, certainly that is not enough. Uh, but as I said, I don't know the case. What help did the elders give her personally? Uh, what are the circumstances? But I agree with you that something far more than a letter like this would be required to help her. And do you also appreciate that, that it, is, it could, in fact, be even some a strict reliance on just giving scriptural, scriptural guidance to someone who has suffered extreme trauma can, in fact, result in even a more damaging outcome for that particular person? Do you accept that? Uh, what I accept is that sometimes when a, the, a letter is written, it's very hard to convey the spirit behind the letter. Uh, I certainly would expect as a member of the governing body that anyone writing a letter from a branch would do so in the spirit of love and concern. Uh, so perhaps, but I do admit that if someone read this, uh, they perhaps could uh, not see that love and concern. And we accept that by what she has said in her letter, which was, now I can only leave the matter in your hands, and I won't, it's a five-page letter that there's not enough time to go through clearly here now, but throughout that letter she is seeking assistance, guidance, help. She's told you about the trauma she has experienced, but you, there's a real duty, isn't there, to do something about the uh, overall well-being of a person such as BCG. Uh, I agree with what you said. They need far more than just one letter. And do you agree that, that given the special nature of the congregation, as I think you have uh, said before, uh, that it's not just a case of congregation where people turn up and go to church, it's a family, that there is uh, therefore an even uh, greater duty within that family to ensure that people like BCG are... Uh, um, cared for in a comprehensive way. Uh, I agree totally with you, uh, probably more so than you realise. Uh, each sheep in the congregation is, is someone that needs to be cared for and loved. And uh, it, I find it very, very hard to believe that this was the only hope that was given to her. And if, in fact, that was the case, my heart goes out to her. And certainly we need to make sure that more help is given than this. And I just want to you know, come back to the point I made before about, or the questions that I asked you before in relation to um, ensuring that there was some research done. For example, uh, Dr. Apple White came here, and really to to really say that the education program was a good one and perhaps better than some others. But there was no um, research to demonstrate how effective, in fact, the Jehovah's Witness program was. Um, and again, I apologise for the for my question, but I'm trying to be, um, get to a point, which is that, in, that it is really disheartening for the survivors that 
um, evidence from people such as Dr Applewhite, without any reference whatsoever to the victim's experience, suggests to them that the reason for engaging experts is to, in fact, rather, um, if I can say, it has more to do with the reputation of the Jehovah's Witnesses than any real attempt to get to a deep understanding of their experience. Um, I, I certainly hope that is not the case, and that certainly was not the intent of it. So please uh, be assured that we are interested in the individuals such as the uh, the client that uh, you're representing. Yeah. Uh, I just want to go back and to... Please, uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I just... And may I take this opportunity... Uh, I don't know your client, but please, could you convey an expression of my love and concern and uh, reassure her that, uh, uh, that obviously uh, she's had an opportunity to, to speak about how she feels and hopefully this will help the policies and procedures to improve. I just want to now go to something a little bit, if I could say, more technical. If we go to uh, document uh, Tender Bundle 120 at page um, 72, which I think is... Seventy-two. I just want to ask you, it refers there to the testimony of youths as being a, mm -hmm. uh, under, under paragraph 37, where we're looking at um, evidence established wrongdoing and just how the Jehovah's Witness would view the testimony of a youth. Mm -hmm. it, I note that it says there, the testimony of youths may be considered, it is up to the elders to determine whether the testimony has the ring of truth. Just in relation to that, I just, how, well firstly, how would you define a youth? Mm -hmm. Are you able to um, assist? As, 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 a, as someone still in a family arrangement uh, under the legal age. When you, but perhaps in this context, I, I'm sure it means probably someone younger. So, if, if there, is there some doubt about the testimony of youth that you wouldn't accept that it would carry less weight, perhaps, than the testimony of, of an adult? I'm just trying to understand what the okay. basis for that yes. is. Pardon? No, thank you very much for asking the question. It's a very good question. Uh, may I just mention, this is in the context of general uh, disputes or things that may be handled. Uh, and uh, could I give you an example that is not related to the Commission? It could be, uh, say, for example, uh, a mother and a father decide to separate, there's a divorce, and now the children, maybe the mother has uh, primed the children to say certain things about the father uh, in order to get custody of the child. Now, of course, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are not involved with deciding if, if parents, uh, how they do divorces and so on. But, you see, in a case like that, in the, uh, uh, in the testimony of a child, you'd have to take in consideration in that situation whether or not they were influenced by one of the parents or otherwise. It's just only a, a caution uh, to make sure that the, uh, the evidence is credible. But may I stress, this is, this is a general principle across all the type of things that we're handling. I, I, to, can I just sorry. understand? I'm not quite sure I'm understanding. Um, wouldn't it be the case that you would have to consider the evidence of anyone to determine whether it had the ring of truth, whether they were a youth, child or adult? What's the difference? Uh, that is true, Your Honour. Well, that what, is what, true. Why are you... Uh, why are... To start, can I just say, with regard to... Uh, sexual abuse, we've already made the statement that the child would be believed. But in these general principles that I tried to highlight with regard to a divorce or some other things, uh, perhaps a child who is dependent upon a parent may be influenced in some way by them. So, this is here to mark out the risk that someone's evidence might be influenced by another person, including an adult. That's correct, Your Honour, yes. And it's only a reminder. It's uh, in no way designed to say that children uh, cannot give evidence. 
Um, very well. Thank you. Just if, if, in relation to, given that you've categorised the testimony of youth, is there any other, the, the, the testimony of children, is there, I'm just, it, the testimony of children is not mentioned at all there, so I'm just concerned as to whether the testimony of children would have even lesser weight because of the age of a child and perhaps uh, their vulnerability to influence. Uh, I'm not quite sure of your question, I'm sorry, but uh, this is just in the context of, uh, it, like you see, the next bullet point mentions the testimony of unbelievers and disfellowship of disassociated ones. Uh, it says may also be considered. Uh, so again, if someone has dis disassociated themselves, perhaps they, they have a grudge against someone in the organisation, uh, but this person is credible in giving a witness, they could uh, give a testimony. So it's just giving some general guidelines, common sense, nous type things to those that are handling these cases, but in no way is it designed to stop these ones. I was going to ask you about this bullet point, but you took us to it. Um, it separates out the testimony of unbelievers and disfellowshipped or disassociated ones. Um, it says that it may be considered, but it must be weighed carefully. It suggests to an outsider that what the document is doing is uh, expressing a need for extra caution when it's the evidence of an unbeliever as opposed to a believer that's being considered. Is that a correct reading of the document? Uh, the reading of the document is saying that someone who doesn't agree with or feel the same way we do about the scriptures perhaps may take a different viewpoint on certain things. Uh, for example, the matter of lying. Uh, you see, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, endeavor to uh, be truthful and present facts in a truthful manner. Someone who is not a witness may have no uh, <laughs> difficulties at all about telling a lie. I'm not saying, Your Honour, that no uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, are perfect, but I'm just, that's just a reminder there that uh, uh, these ones perhaps could make a false statement. So I, my assumption is correct, that uh, the document is saying be more careful with the evidence of unbelievers than you would be with the evidence of believers. Is that right? That's what it says. Yes, Your Honour. Uh, sorry, just to be, be, to be clear on the issue of the testimony of a, of a child, again, what, is there an age that you might define a child, you know, compared with, with a youth, to, to make that distinction? Is there any age category or some criteria that you would uh, use? Uh, or? Sorry, I wish I could answer your question, but I think that goes to people more qualified than I am. Uh, but if, if, just coming to that, would that be a, an area that you would review in the context or in, in relation to any wrongdoing, but particularly in relation to, obviously, the matters in issue here, in relation to the testimony of, of youths? Because do you agree that that could very much confuse a, an elder who took that literally to, you know, begin with a, a level of scepticism about the testimony of a youth? Uh, your point is well taken, and uh, that's why we update this book from time to time when we see perhaps uh, inadequacies in it. And that, and that as a whole, it might, by omitting uh, reference to a child, uh, it might make the reader consider, well, what is the status of the evidence of a child? Does it have any value at all? There's all other points. Yeah. Uh, just, and just an argument, uh, when you were um, answering questions earlier to counsel assisting and, Your Honour, you clearly seemed open to the idea that perhaps prior to the Judicial Committee um, it might be an opportunity for women to be involved in that preliminary, um, if I could say, preliminary investigative stage. I'm just coming down to the uh, point of where it says there must be two or three eyewitnesses, not just people repeating hearsay. Um, just, I, I'm, 
I just see that if you look at that point there, that there must be two or three eyewitnesses, not just people repeating hearsay, that you would really have to formalise a process whereby uh, if a, an abused person spoke to, for example, a couple of female um, sisters, that that wouldn't then just take on the character of a hearsay evidence. Do you understand what I'm, the point I'm making there? I, I understand your point, and yeah. uh, yes. I just guess what I'm saying is that when you are looking at policies, my, it, it, do you agree that it would be worthy of ensuring that that did not perhaps confuse an elder in attempting to interpret mm -hmm. this policy, that in fact um, it would diminish the value of, of um, involving women at that point? Um, that's a good point. And uh, let me say, we're always interested in trying to improve whatever we do. Um, so, again, just coming back to the scriptures, that, again, clearly, as uh, BCG was a very devout uh, young Jehovah's Witness, that, that the importance of ensuring that whatever scriptural guidance a devout um, Jehovah's Witness survivor um, is given that it is, you know, it just can't be come from a, a one-size-fits-all scriptural package. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? I, that, I agree that, totally. That I, it must, I do agree totally. That it, mm -hmm. it must be uh, tempered with, uh, by having real experts uh, consider how uh, a young person like a BCG might internalise certain scriptures in a way that is uh, ultimately quite destructive. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Mr Bannon, no? No. Mr Stewart, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't, Your Honour. Yes, very well. Well, that completes your evidence, sir. Thank you very much for your time today. You're now formally excused from your summons. Uh, Thank you. Mr Stewart, right? Yes, Your Honour. Uh, two things. One, in relation to the directions, um, those were made a week ago on the basis of four weeks for submissions and four weeks thereafter. Um, given that we've had this evidence today a week later and that... No. Dr. Applewhite's report is still to come. No. I was we'll going to leave, ask whether we can have it. No, we'll leave the directions in place. It's important, yes. like it is with all matters, that we ensure that we dispose of them as efficiently as possible. I'm not prepared today, by reason of the fact that we have this further evidence, to vary the directions. As if, however, case. there are circumstances that emerge down the track, then I won't be so hard as to say there can never be an application, but not today. As, as Your Honour pleases. Very well. And then the only remaining issue, um, in, the, in the intervening week a further document has come to light which um, really just sits in the uh, sequence of correspondence um, to bodies uh, or relating to correspondence to all bodies of elders and uh, I'd like to have leave to uh, tender it. Well, Can I mark it separately? It should be marked separately on this. I'll mark it Exhibit 2834. So what it is, is it's a letter dated 10 October 2002 from Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia to all bodies of elders in Australia. Yes. And that's all that I have you on. If there's nothing further, I'll adjourn. All stands.